remember we have uh, exam Tuesday. So this is the last, this is number 20 in the unit. So this, this is it. So we'll share our screen, go to modern practices and start to work. From the beginning, there we go. All right, I think this comes, up. you gotta go back to the beginning of your textbook. I wanna say uh, chapter seven and eight are included in this if you're wondering where the material is. Um, it was kind of the role of my, you know, of everything. But we're, we're gonna just, this is kinda gonna be a uh, informative slash future slash um, what I might be seeing more of when I finally get out of class and get to work, right? So that's where we're headed. So you took intro to micro, um, nurse, you know, the micro for health professions, and that kind of got you started thinking micro, and then you came in here and we went through just every organism that we could as far as causing a problem. And then in lab, we tried to show you everything as much as we could growing in front of you. But we know that's never enough. And then you're gonna to go to clinical and they're gonna throw, you know, um, 30 cultures out in front of you and say, go ahead and start processing and tell us what you would do to set those up. You're gonna be doing tests um, uh, on every organism. You're gonna know some of them, you're gonna recognize some of them. Some of them are still gonna, trick you up a little bit, trip you up, not trick, trip you up a little bit. Uh, and then you're eventually gonna go and set them on an ID panel and voila, you're gonna finish up your work and it's gonna tell you what the culture was or is. And then you're gonna look at your antimicrobials and then you're gonna move on from that one and wait on the next sample to come in or work on the next one. So it's, it can be a long day in micro um, depending on what you have in front of you growing. Can you decipher it? Do you need to decipher it? Where is it, where, you know, is it a important enough to go ahead and try to decipher it? Well, but the end result may be, it really wasn't that important. It may end up with Klebsiella oxytaca, which is a environmental organism, skin flora. But that might be important depending on where it came from. So keep all that, you've done really well. I think we've done a good job this time about getting everything in and seeing it in front of you. We had a lot of growth going on for you this year. We had a lot of uh, gram staining going on for you. So we added that from last year's class. I wanted to see a lot of different growth, a lot of different options. Still not the full option of, hey, here comes the culture and we work from day one to the, the next day. The only way we could really do that, like really, is to, to play with the idea of putting micro back to back, is to have lecture and lab back to back and do immunology back to back. So that's something, and that's probably what I'll ask you at the end, what would your, how would you change the setup? Would it be better to do that since you've moved through all the labs and, and lecture? So you know the role, hopefully we've gotten that to you. But if we haven't, you know, infectious agents, these are, it's a lot of wordy. This is a wordy, wordy stuff. Uh, it's almost like a full presentation wordy. Um, but, you know, we're, we're to find the infectious agents. We look at it, um, you know, we have our host, we rely on our, you know, the organism relies on the host, destroys the host lives off of it, causes infection, uh, then we have to come up with effective treatment. That's kind of our role. We play that role with the doctors, of course. Um, effective treatment for that infectious. Rapid ID would be nice, right? So some of the things we're gonna get to uh, in the last part of the lecture are gonna be showing you how we have made speed a priority and we can get some of these back ID in an in, in hour. Uh, we don't have to wait the full day to look at it after one day's growth. Um, so that's where we're headed. 
So we started here with conventional biochemical tests. We did a little bit of this, but not. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Nobody <laughs> mentioned that I didn't have the screen on. I just didn't know if you were. Well, you you didn't miss anything. Sorry, I was my screen was up. I was just moving right along. Yeah, thanks. I was like, hey. Um. <laughs> anyway. Give me a chance to get it cranked up here. Uh, Zoom could see it. Couldn't you Zoom? No problem there. Y'all didn't need a screen in the classroom. You had it. Okay, there we go. So here are, you know, our lovely biochemical uh, reactions. You saw these, not, not, uh-oh. Okay. What happened? Here we go. Maybe, yay. All right. Still having trouble with our video. All right. So you saw these, but where did you see these? Where did you see citrate turn blue? Yeah, you had it in the API, so you had, you didn't have the tubes, right? I, I think y'all did this in the micro for health professions. I think you started there. Um, yeah, because you're, you're taking this, so you can see it in the tube, taking the change, and then converting it into the API strip. We started there, more so than a tube, and then we moved to the um, microscan panels which we're gonna finish up today. So we have conventional substrates found in plated tube media, such as carbohydrates, amino acids, urea, citrate. And y'all tell me if this is, I think everything is part of your presentation. I mean, you have these slides, so I don't know how this is reading toward the slides exactly, but hopefully it's good. Um, Multi-test system. You know, we, we have moved you past just the tube testing, right? So we get into the ID panel. Uh, we, we, we did some impregnated discs, you know, through the semester. You guys have won some lovely ones downstairs with our, um, our Mueller Hinton that we used. Just exactly what I wanted you to see. I mean, it's perfect, okay? So you can see the zone. But now we don't, we really don't, we do still run zones. I want you to think about, you know, we still run uh, tax away A disc and P disc for our straps. Um, and there's some others. Um, but for the most part, you know, the antimicrobial setup is in the panel. But we still do add those to our, our growth just to see. So our we're heading to rapid testing, right? Which can provide identification of less than four to six hours. And they use chromogenic substrates. These are synthetic compounds that colonize, convert to color, preformed enzymes. So really what we're looking at, I don't want to spend too much time there for sure. You know, kind of giving you a history going back and forth and looking at the chemicals that change and give us a different color. Move this out of the way here, move that. Okay. So we, we think about E. coli. E. coli uh, moves this reaction along with beta-galactosidase, the enzyme, the de deimerizing blue pigment, I think if you wanted to get into that, we could, but I think what you're hoping to see is we want to move past the slow growing organism requiring significant increase um, moving from that. So how are we going to move from that? So we can come back to beta lactamase testing. We just went through that. We can actually put that in the panel that we're using. So the panel is going to tell us if that well is positive or not. Nitrocephin disc test, you can do the disc to see if beta lactamase is present. But in our microscan plates, we're going to have nitrocephin to tell us if beta lactamase is forming. Another advancement in ID is uh, 
fluorogenic substrates where we can get them to light up, wide range of synthetic substances, conjugates, enzymatic cleavage, all that good stuff. But we have fluorescent being produced. So alkaline phosphatase converting fluorescent diphosphate. And then we can see that we can light that up. And we use that with things like fish, okay? So this is the way this lecture is gonna move if you hadn't figured this out. So you have, I'm giving you this kind of as a, you know, hey, let's read about where we're going, but we're not going to focus early on the early stuff. We're gonna focus on the later stuff. And I don't wanna just skip over and get there, but we're, we're working our way there. So multi-test systems, you started with API and y'all had API 20 E's and we're gonna get, we were gonna do some API 20 C's, but um, we may have to just do those for you and let you see those. Uh, we had staff and strep. Um, now we've moved to the gram positive micro scan panels. There's another one out there you may be uh, exposed to when clinical arrives and it's called the Vitec. And it's a card system. And it's a, basically a walk away identifier where you load the card, the color changes in the card, and then the computer reads that card for ID. So it's a lot like Microscan, but it's, a, it's, it's not a widely used system as it used to be because Microscan has come in. Uh, but still, you may run into a lab here and there that uses the Vitec. We use gram stain. Um, we use Haemophilus and Neisseria ID panels to identify Neisseria and Haemophilus. So this is, if you haven't noticed, a lot of the old in our micro was this, right? It was basically, we'll give you a pattern identification and then you tell us if it's Staph aureus or not based on all the different roles of so what I did, which was try to pick out the most important identifiers, not so much the whole list of identifiers, but there may be one or two other, you know, question writers that like to like, hey, let's give them a pattern and see if they remember it from class. Um, but just keep in mind, if you know the, the major ones, the ones we focus on, uh, you should be able to figure it out, hopefully, but you might be tripped up if you see that because we were moving toward the automated system. Uh, the Vitec and the Microscan both have walkaway systems. So the plated and tube media, which form the basis of the manual ID, are some of the same biochemical, we just said this, right? Same biochemical tests have been miniaturized so they can be utilized on the system. Automated identifications have found widespread acceptance. So a lot of clinical lab, micro labs like to do the automated, which means is that you load it, you walk away and it'll tell you when it's done. You don't do anything other than that. So we have two very popular systems, the Microscan walk away and the Vitec 2. Both have employed the use of conditional panels with instruments to read them. So we use a Microscan uh, right now you're reading those manually. The next step is you have a um, little analyzer that reads them for you. Then the next step is to get a whole system that uh, you don't even have to load it. You load it at the beginning and it tells you when it's done with it. Kind of like the, uh, the blood cultures that we're going to see. You load it and it tells you if it's positive and it's done or you wait till it's negative and, and pull it out. So speed, because basically what they're saying is, is once, once the growth reaches a point where it can be ID, used to, we would wait till the next day to bring them back out like we've done here in lab and read them. That may be 24 hours since you put it in. But what these systems do is they monitor them. And if the ID can occur faster, it IDs it. So the idea of, hey, I got to wait to the next day to know what organism I have, these take that out. So they actually do those as they become positive and actually uh, change. 
So here's the Vitec look. Here's the card I was telling you about. You can see the reactions, the way we've been reading them. So it kind of looks like the API a little bit, but it's not, it's not a well, um, but it is a card, a double plied card basically. So there it is. So as you see, the computer has it programmed where it waits on the color change to happen. Once it gets enough info, it IDs it. Antibiotic susceptibility can be done on the Vitec 2. Here's the Vitec 2 walk away. Do your gram stain, prepare your inoculum, put it on the Vitec disc, put it in the machine, boom, done. Here's the microscan walk away. This is what we were um, offered. I hate to say that, but we were offered one of these. Uh, as they were retiring an older, bigger model, and they were getting a younger, younger, smaller model. Um, and eventually, maybe we would revisit that, but all you do is take those same microscan panels that we have, you load those, you put them in here, and it, it runs it till it's done with it. So you don't have to pull them out and add a drop of indole and a drop of nitrate. So you're very familiar with this panel. We except the one we did get, the combo was not there. But you get your reactions up here, just like the API was, and then you read these levels, and we did that. And then you have a growth well and a control well. Control shouldn't be having anything, but the growth should. And then you see your different antibiotics. There's your nitrites over here. Um, and then you have your antibiotic sensitivity. So you are going to read this today. Be ready for that if you had a negative panel and set up that smelly bleach smelling thing. It's still smelling down there. Even y'all's panels are smelling. Yeast panel, that's what we were going, going to. We were going to use uh, an API yeast. They make it for everything. So the microbiologist now has other time to work on other things. Um, maybe get more involved. Maybe get have time to work on the uh, antibiogram and keep an eye on that daily instead of waiting each month to put it together. So this is where we are and this is where we're going to do a lab uh, next week. It's blood cultures. Y'all have told me that hey we didn't really get a uh, blood culture update or how to draw them. So we'll practice that. I think it's important that you do at least know how to draw these because they're part of your draw. For the most part, you know, the, it's the sterile sterility. How well do you clean the arm? Sterile tube can be used instead of the blood culture bottle. Um, we call that the yellow top, not gold, right? Y'all have y'all seen a yellow top downstairs? Do we have any? Or do we just do blood culture bottles? Y'all even seen a blood culture bottle? Huh? No? Good. It's going to be fun. Um, we take those blood culture bottles and what they do is they measure the CO2. So as the organism grows, CO2 is produced. If it's in the blood, the CO2 pH changes a disc at the bottom of the two, at the bottom of the bottle. And then the analyzer, the, the, the back T alert monitors that change every, you know, every so many minutes it runs a check on all the bottles and it, if it senses one, it will really let you know it. It almost scares you to death because it will either start screaming or it plays a big loud horn. Uh, it wants the whole lab to know there's a positive blood culture. And then we go into the blood culture analyzer and pull out the positive. And then from that, we do a gram stain. We gram stain the blood out of the blood culture bottle. See what we have. Is it gram positive cocci? Is it gram negative rod? What What is the growing in the blood culture bottle. And then um, we set it up. We'll streak it out. We streak it out on blood, McConkie, chocolate, um, anaerobe. And what we see is both of these bottles are designed for aerobic and anaerobic growth. So, but most of the time it's an aerobic growth and it's growing in both bottles. 
Um, and that's what's weird too, because one bottle will turn positive and it's not minutes, but the other one usually turns positive. So you're sitting there working with one and the machine goes off again. But CO2 being produced, uh, the color metric sensor at the bottom of each bottle changes color from blue to light green or yellow as the pH decreases. So this bicarb that's produced because the CO2 changes the sensor, changes the pH, changes the sensor at the bottom. The machine picks that up. So here they are. This looks just like mine that I work with. This one here, a two drawer. Uh, so when you get ready to load a bottle, you will hit um, bottle here, right? And then you pull this drawer out and you'll see um, the bottles here that you load in. And we scan those, usually they're labeled, they have a certain label. We, we scan the labels with the accession number of the patient and that connects the bottle to the patient. Sometimes they'll tell you, hey nurse, you can just come back here if you draw some and just throw them in there and we'll figure it out later. And that happens. But I was also informed late here recently that it's actually better not to put them um, in any ink, don't put them in any incubator until you're ready to put them in here because you don't want to miss the change, right? So if you, if you incubate them without being in the machine, the sensor won't maybe pick up the change in the, the color of the bottom of the bottle. So that's something to note. But here they are. So we have back to alert bottles. Okay, so what you see is, is that one of these is for aerobic and one is for anaerobic. And in the draw, it's, most of us will use a butterfly during the draw for blood cultures. So I always taught my phlebotomists, what is the best thing to remember with the butterfly? From the needle to the hub of the butterfly is air. So it's taught that the butterfly, if you use a butterfly draw for blood cultures, that you put blood in the aerobic first because of the air in the tube. You don't want to introduce that, that gap of air into an anaerobe bottle. Then you put the anaerobe on second. Why do we have this one over here? <laughs> this is almost like a, a, a pediatric model. It's about one mil less required, but the phlebotomist sometimes doesn't give you enough blood. You're supposed to put five mils of blood in each one of these bottles to be optimum for growth. So think about that. You get one yellow top for a sterile draw, it should have 10 mils in it, maybe eight mils, maybe six, you know. I'm getting them like this. Yeah, I, I put a splash of blood in there for you, for your blood culture. Well, then that forces you to use the pediatric bottle, and you shouldn't have to be forced to do that. So I told the phlebotomist kindly and gently, I need a tube full. Give me a, give me a yellow top. Don't listen to what everybody's told you. I'm needing a full tube. So I, because I might have to set up two sets with that, All right? And I want to, I don't want to use the PD bottle every time and only get one bottle for the patient. I'd like to have two bottles each time. Get one of each. Oh, when you do the PD, it's just aerobic. Yeah, you're just stuck with one bottle. They used to make them where they would say, even if the patient was on an antibiotic treatment, they had a charcoal in there and it would absorb out that. So it was still okay to use it. So one of the things with, we're going to see with phlebotomy is, is that they wait on you to draw that blood culture before they start hanging a bag of antibiotics on. So they wait on you. They get mad if you're not coming on down there and drawing. Um, but that if you missed it, like, hey, the patient's already had a dose of antibiotic and now we want blood cultures, probably not ever going to grow anything out of that bottle because you're about to put blood in the bottle that has antibiotics loaded and it just won't allow the organism to grow if it was there. So a lot of times, like, you, like I said, you may have an option of a charcoal loaded bottle to absorb antibiotic to help you recover the organism if it's still growing 
against that antibody. That was, uh, who was that? Back T Alert. Then we have Back Tech 9000. Uh, Becton Dick Dickinson uses a fluorescent as a means to measure the CO2 created by the bacterial metabolism. This bicarb decreased in pH increases the fluorescent output of the sensor to pick up. <coughs> That's the Back Tech. tech. So you got Back T Alert, you got Back Tech Alert or Back Tech. So this is just a different maker. These are bottles. As you see, there's a different style in the bottle that they want. Basically these, I think these started out as glass, now they're plastic, <coughs> excuse me. But it was, as you see the, the amount, this is optimum. So what you can see is the volume of the media here, and then they want you to put the blood to the next line. So five mils of blood per two on this one, or bottle. All right, but we're gonna have fun. We're gonna do that um, next week in lab. We'll do a, uh, we're gonna have all the, the yeast growing, hopefully next week, so you can see those before you leave. Uh, if they're not growing well on Tuesday, or some of them will be growing on Tuesday, we'll look at them again on Thursday, so it's gonna be a whole week of mycology. We're gonna set those up tomorrow. Um, and in the meantime, as you're looking, we'll teach you uh, blood cultures too. So I'll show you how to do that. Because we have plenty of bottles. We have about two cases. It's one thing you usually, like, usually you see, because usually the deal, they'll say, hey, we're going to give you a blood culture analyzer, like that thing, the back T alert, like we're going to give you one of those. And then we're going to send you like two cases of bottles every month. And those kind of can pile up real quick if you're not using that many. But you will have ER doctors that will prefer to have two sets on every patient that comes to the ER that day. Get ready for that kind of thing. Just becomes routine. The CBC, CMP, and blood cultures. And then we want strep and flu on top of that. Now COVID too. So you, you get doc, especially ER doctors, they get in a routine or they get in a, a a habit of this is what I want on everybody so I can start there. And that's what they do, right? Uh, in the work of diagnosing and monitoring human disease, molecular diagnostics, this is the future. So if you hadn't been awake already today, then you need to wake up because molecular is where we're headed. We're already there for the most part, but not every lab. I, I think I bet every lab is, is playing with molecular somehow, some way now. Um, we just don't know exactly when we need to make a class with just molecular. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're getting close. Um, molecular diagnosis in involves the use of nucleic acids, genomes, and proteins. We can do protonomics. Okay, so one of our best micro machines is called MALDI, and it bases on the protein pattern of the bacteria. That's how it IDs. So it doesn't need the genetic material. It may just look at the protein pattern and it has a hundred different protein patterns because every different bacteria has a different one. And then the machine just picks up your sample, IDs that protein pattern and will tell you what you have. So Maldi is really quick about telling you what you have. Just we have to keep the sensitivity going. Uh, and there actually is new technology now that actually helps with that. Um, and I don't know if it's in here or not, but it's, it is one where it actually monitors it with a video camera, the growth of the organism in the well with the antibiotic. And it can determine if the growth is quick, it will say that organism is going to be resistant to that antibiotic. And if the growth is minimum or nothing, it will tell you it's sensitive and it will give you a quicker response but it's watching it. It's like monitoring the growth of it in the well without you being there. You don't have to be there to look at it. Um, so that's really neat. And I think UAMS has a couple of those uh, in their lab. So if you end up in a bigger lab, you will probably be in that technology. Um, one of the things that we really get excited about is when we can take you to AEL, which is the um, 
esoteric um, uh, reference lab over in Memphis and their micro department has this, um, I don't know if they call it the behemoth, but it's this big room of just a thing. And it's almost like a, it looks like a, um, a factory in there. But it, it actually video, it, the, you don't have to go to the plate itself unless you're gonna pick a colony. It monitors it so you're watching a computer screen and looking for the growth of the plate as it moves by. Is that fun? And even to the point, what's the real fun is that it actually streaks for you. So you put the drop of the organism on the plate and it has this metallic ball that runs back and forth on the plate and streaks the plate for you. You don't even have to get a loop out to streak. That makes what we're doing feels ancient. Ancient? No, because when we get you get there, like you can do your clinical over there. You can do your micro clinical. That's why I'm making a mention of this. As you do your clinical over there, you know up to that point where everything should be, and then they show you how they do it. Why? Because they got to have volume. They take samples from all the Baptist hospitals in this region, show up at Memphis for micro. Baptist hospitals do not do micro anymore. They send them over there. So you get to do everybody's micro from every hospital, Baptist hospital. All right. So the biological process, of course, is, is moved up from where we used to know to how it is today. Um, here's one, a respiratory panel of the elite MGB panel detects different one single reaction for Mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, C pneumonia, what's C pneumonia? And L pneumophilia, oh gosh, we got a, it's a good test, isn't it? Good test question right here for y'all today. Did I help you with the mycoplasma pneumonia? Pneumonia, what's the C pneumonia and what's the L uh, pneumophilia? Who's good at knowing all these abbreviations? Or do I need to start having fill in the blanks test? No. no? Is the C clostridium? Clostridium pneumonia? Anybody agree with that? Clostridium? Corny back? Oh, we got a disc. We got a choice. We're either going to go corny back, corny A bacter or clostridium pneumophilia. Nobody's going to their cheat sheet or their guide. Allie's typing fast. She's thinking she can Google this. And if you end up with the L pneumophilia, that would be awesome too while you're looking. The L is Legionella. Legionella, okay, yay, because it's Philadelphia and that's where our big convention was. What about C? Chlamydia. Yeah. Pneumonia? Chlamydia? No, that's, I you know. Chlamydia. We got three so far. Chlamydia, Lostridium, and Cornea. Which one are we going to go with? Which one are we all going to agree on? Looking, looking. The only one there that is breaking up is chlamydia. So I assume chlamydia. chlamydia? I, I don't know. Do we have, do we have it in our text. No. Let's see where we did do it. Did we do chlamydia pneumonia? Mm -hmm. Let me find them here. Chlamydia. Comatous. I know we did that one. I don't see any. There it is. You got 557, 562, 562, 562, 562. It's in here. We might not have spent much time on it. Yeah. Chlamydia pneumonia. First isolated from conjunctiva of a child in Taiwan in 1965. Okay. Yes, that's it. 
I'll go with that. So where are we now? We're, you know, we're at nucleic acid probes. I think we've mentioned those enough here this semester. Hopefully you understand RNA versus DNA. This just tells us, like, you know, it's just, you know, depressing here. Conventional diagnosis is based on isolation and culture of the infectious agent it can be processed as time consuming. That's depressing now. Y'all, you're like, oh gosh, there's something that's faster than what we've been doing. For some microorganisms, they can culture and incubation period very prolonged, like who? Who's M. tuberculosis? Not mycoplasma. What is it? Mycobacteria. Yes, okay. TB. Four to eight weeks, all right? Additionally, we have others. Other problems with conventional ID procedures. Uh, must be viable when it's placed on or appropriate culture media. I had one last weekend that <coughs> didn't ID. It ID'd as very weird. It was like 30% ID. I went back to the purity plate, checked it. Um, Lauren on this. Lauren helped me out. She was working with me this weekend. There's Lauren. We went back and looked and it was nothing growing. Somehow, some way, we missed a day on that one because it didn't get transferred over. Uh, it did ID eventually, so the next day, so it was good. We ended up finishing that one up. Uh, some organisms are just too dangerous to culture in our lab. And then we see level four. And if you didn't know where we are, we're at level two. We don't go past level two. So you can imagine we don't have Bacillus anthrax or your Yersinius pestis. Or if we do, we don't bring them out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Ebola viruses. Uh, and I think, I don't, if I remember, I don't think Ebola was a four. It might be. Anyway, there's some that you would think would be higher than they are, and they're not that high up on the scale. But as you go up to three and four, that means you've got to get in containment suits, and you've got to get into containment rooms, and you have to work through it into a box, that kind of stuff, because you can't get exposed to it. So it's protection of the, the surroundings and the people working with them. Um, other microorganisms have been recovered and grow sufficient quantities to ensure ID. Um, definitive ID requires pure cultures and may have additional testing. So we may have um, <clears throat> cross, we may have more than one organism. You've got experience with that now. Y'all have opened up some plates and go, ooh, Right, that's what we do when we go, ooh. Um, this past weekend was I had, I had two E. coli's, right, out of a urine, two, two, and you know how I knew it was two? One was lactose fermenting and one wasn't. So I separated them onto a McConkie and one was pink and one was gray, and they both were E. coli. So that was two different strains of E. coli on the same culture. So it looks weird on my report because it says E. coli on one page and page over here says E. coli. And basically their antibiotic sensitivity was pretty much the same. So, but I had to call it different because it was not fermenting lactose. One was and one wasn't. So that was weird. That was something weird I had uh, to work with. So that, it didn't cost me a day, but it could have. It could have cost me a day because I would have separated out first and waited a day to say it was two different kinds. I went ahead and picked both kinds and set them up for ID and sensitivity and then let the split confirm it. But that was risky, right? It wasn't, it wasn't obvious, oh, I can find isolation. Uh, did I find isolation? Uh, so that was kind of scary. Okay, so molecular. So let's look at the nucleic acid synthesis, just to review right quick. I know y'all love this part of the lecture when we get into molecular. I know y'all love when we hit DNA and RNA. Is anybody a big fan of DNA and RNA? You just love it, can't get enough of it? No hands. Any hands on Zoom? 
Zoom, Zoom, you anybody over there a big DNA RNA fan? Can't get enough? I'm just seeing who might be my molecular micro people. Um, of course, DNA, RNA chains are produced in cells by copying a pre existing DNA. It looks like Heather's volunteering. Existing DNA strand according to the rules of Watson and Crick pairing. Y'all know that. We, I think we reviewed those, I think, didn't we, with the ATs and the GCs combining, and which one was pyrimidase and pyrimidines. Somebody's going to correct me on that. Okay. We did. You corrected me on that? No, I'm just saying that. I think I said pyrimidase. Was, should it be pyrimidase? I don't remember. That's why I didn't want to say anything. But that's why I was, yeah. And we have complementary strands. So if we have a DNA, a template, the new strand is a complementary strand. Template messenger RNA is a template to be translated, transcribed. So pre existing DNA, DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. Retroviruses are different, they go RNA to DNA to RNA and protein. So we'll go reverse here at the beginning of those. We mentioned those the other day. All RNA and DNA synthesis proceeds in one direction from the five prime end to the three prime. Special enzymes called polymerases elongate the RNA and DNA. And then we talked about some antimicrobials that work right there, right? Uh, DNA polymerases are enzymes that copy DNA to make strands of DNA called replication. RNA polymerases are enzymes that copy RNA from DNA. So this is a very good review for those that need a review in their genetics and their molecular DNA and RNA terminology. So what, what is the technology? What are we doing with genetic testing? Each infectious agent carries a unique genetic code. So code breaking is very important. You want to know, that's how we knew the COVID virus was a new virus because it had, a, we, we genetically mapped it to see what it was and it didn't match anything that's been around before. Um, so we have that, we can, we can store it, transmit it. And then we have to develop um, a blueprint, right? We have, to, we have to see what we need. And then we take those little bits of pieces and we mix them in and we get something to bind to it. So that's what we do with, with these film arrays that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. So viruses are the exception because they're capable of transferring genetic information to successive generations through the agency of their either RNA DNA. Primary situation where foreign DNA and RNA is present, host tissue is infectious because each organism contains a unique nucleic acid sequence. So we use a new nucleic acid probe technology where we start, utilizes labeled nucleic acid segments of DNA or RNA to detect the presence of the microorganism in the patient specimen. DNA segments have been the most popular choice for creating new nucleic acid probes. It's even possible to make DNA probe using a strand of RNA, right? Because we kind of do it like a retro uh, virus as the template, in the case of DNA probe synthesized using enzyme called RNA dependent DNA polymerase or reverse transcriptase. How does the DNA probe work? That's what you came for, right? Nucleic probe technology was originally developed to detect microorganisms. I think I've covered that. In the first step, the cells are disrupted. So there's a mechanical disruption of the cells and DNA strands are separated out. The DNA is then denatured. In other words, the double strand is separated into single strands using detergents, heat, or enzymes. That single strand of DNA is then fixed on a solid surface. 
The label probe is added and allowed to react with material in the solid support. And if the complementary sequence is present, the probe anneals with the target DNA, bound to support medium. The support medium is then washed or removed non-specifically bound DNA and unbound DNA. And then we identify the presence of the label probe on the type of label used. Labels we can use is an enzyme using chromogen. You're very familiar with that. We've been doing that, using that technology in the lab. Or a chemiluminescent molecule can be used for detection. Either way. This basically just shows you uh, the single stranded DNA probes over here with their substrates, the mixture of single stranded messenger RNA on this side. You mix them together and you see that there were some complementary strands that were found. You wash away the unbound. Again, showing you how these would match up, that the sequences were there, the probe target is found, not found, and then we detect. So here's our salmonella DNA fragment is cloned in. This is showing you how you get those cloned DNA probes. We'll look at it that way. So here a salmonella DNA is cloned in E. coli. So this is an E. coli rod. Salmonella DNA is added. And then the cloned DNA fragments are marked with fluorescent. So here we have our unknown bacteria. It's filtered, the cells are lysed, the DNA is released. We mix those two together. Oops, oops, there might be more. Fluorescent probe binds to the salmonella if it's there and then lights it up for detection. Another way of showing it. This is detecting nucleic acid with non-radioactive probe. So that's a start, I think, for you guys. I think that's enough. Sensitivity and specificity of the probe technology are diminished when applied to certain specimens such as stools and sputums. Unacceptable non-specific binding to extraneous materials and stool specimen tends to occur. And the probe technology is unsuitable for identifying organisms through that technology. They have been found to be most useful in confirming the identity of microorganisms in such specimens as pure culture. So we had a problem, right? We can't really put stool in that group and you really can't put sputum in that group, but you know from our lectures that we are doing that. So how are we doing that? Okay, let's get there. Here is the Cephid. Cephid gene expert system. The Cephid is really hot, but the Cephid's run out of stuff, okay? The Cephid was really, really hot technology platform because it was one of the first platforms that did PCR testing for COVID. So NEA Baptist, I know, has a Cephid and had a student working there last semester, spring, and that's what she did her presentation on for virology was the Cephid, how it works. So she showed me how she went about taking the swabs for COVID and put them in the Cephid cartridge and the cartridge was red for positive COVID presence or not. Give you an idea, this is, this is here. So this is not something that you're gonna have to go to AEL to get. This is something you get here uh, and it's being used today. Um, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Cephid or not, does anybody watch um, um, Orange County Choppers? I think it was Cephid that I went to do this with. I think it was Cephid. Anybody watch Orange County Choppers? OC Chopper, you know, the, the father and son building motorcycles. Nobody watches that? Then the story just lost all of its air. Anyway, he was, uh, 
he built them a bike. He built them a chopper. And it was on display at one of the conventions we went to and got a picture with Paul Jr. I don't know if y'all remember that name or not, but yeah. Um, the expert detects DNA sequences specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis and rifampicin resistant by polymerase chain reaction. It's based on a platform for rapid and simple to use nucleic acid amplification tests, NAT. The expert pro purifies the concentrations of micro, or, or TB bacilli from the sputum, isolates genomic material, captures the bacteria by sonication, and subsequently amplifies the genomic DNA by PCR. So kind of the same thing we're doing now with that swab for COVID. Process identifies all clinically re re uh, relevant um, rifampicin resistant mutations in the RNA polymerase beta gene for TB uh, resistance. There it is, it looks like. So as you notice, every system comes with a computer. These are just the different size system that you wouldn't have all this. This is a single cartridge use on one time, you know, because it takes time to run these. Then they came out, you got a four drawer. And I want to say, I, I didn't really see it in the video, but I'm thinking that NEA has something of that size. So what about another approach, a modified approach of Gene Probe? Gene Probe is a technology company devised a probe technology uses a DNA probe to detect complementary strands of ribosomal RNA. The advantage to this is not immediately obvious until one realizes there's only one copy of complementary DNA per cell, but thousands of ribosomal RNA segments in that same cell. So it's going to be what? A better detector. Organisms may contain more than 10,000 ribosomes, and consequently, there are an equal number of ribosomal RNA molecules. Additionally, RNA molecules are already single-stranded, and therefore, they are ready to hybridize without any necessity incorporating denaturation. So their technology does not use a solid support system. It has devised what is called an in-solution approach. Hybridization occurs in solution after cells have been lysed, resulting in DNA probe RNA hybrids to hydroxyapatite. Uh, hydroxyapatite does not bind to non hybridized probe. Any non hybridized nucleic acid molecule would then be washed away, and the hydroxyapatite is spun into a pellet. Okay. So, what do you think about this, right? A test for infectious disease. Market for probe technology is over $1 billion. Nucleic acid testing, this is the group that we can do. We got mycobacterium tuberculosis, we got Neisseria gonorrhea, we got chlamydia trachomatis, Haemophilus influenza, Staph aureus, Listeria monocytogenes, vancomycin resistant, genes being present, not that you would have the or organism, but just the gene being present. Group A, group B, strep, E. coli, intercoccus, strep pneumonia, Campylobacter, salmonella. Um, HIV-1, hepatitis B. We got a couple of others over here. We got a C, amitidius, amitis, H, capsulatum, and B, dermatidius. What are those? Don't leave anything, no stone unturned as we wrap up bacteriology. What are those three? Somebody split those up. Tell me what those are. The C is coccidioides. Coccidioides? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I agree with that. Derm dermatic. Blastomyces. Blastomy. We're going to get into that one in 
after Thanksgiving. And then the H is histoplasma. Histoplasma. Yes. Capsulated. If you're in immunology, we're going to talk about HIV uh, tomorrow, right? Uh, it has three unique genes, a GAG, POL, and an NV, which are part of the viral genome. Makes probe technology an ideal way to detect HIV. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Polymerase chain reaction, PCR, big, big on the list of things we're doing today with COVID. PCR is a single copy of nucleic acids, often undetectable by conventional hybridization. So we need to do something to amplify that. Using PCR, a single copy of nucleic acid target is multiplied 10 million times. Okay, pretty strong, greatly improving its sensitivity uh, to be detected. So we don't need a whole lot, that's what it's saying. We just need a little bit. Uh, we just need maybe one virus detect. So you may not have but one virus in your nasal cavity, but if they kit it on that swab and they do PCR, they're going to find it. It's going to be there. Uh, polymerase chain reaction is a combination of complementary nucleic acid hybridizations and nucleic acid replication. Most widely used target nucleic acid amplification method. So PCR is still hot and heavy today. Uh, process begins by denaturing the target nucleic acid. So that swab we send in, in its wash, the wash is then denatured, heating the sample up to 94 degrees Celsius, which is just shy of what? Boiling. Boiling is 100 degrees Celsius, right? So that this does two things. It disrupts the organism, releasing the nucleic acids and denaturing the DNA into single strands. For RNA targets, the denature is not required. Step two involves primer annealing, where we take a primers, a short sequence of nucleic acid, oligonucleotides of 20 to 30, which specifically hybridize, which means anneal, to the nucleic acid target, essentially functioning like a probe. The abundance of the available gene sequence data allows the design of these probes where we get genus specific primers, species specific primers. So when they, uh, when they, when they identified COVID's genetic code, then boom, we can start making the primers for that for detection. We go, we're skipping around a little bit because we want to get finished. So we have a thermal cycler. Uh, we have those as a little box, not any bigger than it would fit right here on top of my book. Um, and that's what we have over at ABI to do this with. Um, the quantity of double stranded fragments and a double to each. We look for the amplification uh, detection of the target nucleic acid strand can involve the use of radioactive, colorimetric, fluorometric, chemiluminescent signals to probe for that. So this is kind of what we're looking at with the cycler. So we heat the first strand of DNA from that we disrupt with the 95 degrees Celsius. Then we do the annealing at 55 degrees Celsius where we combine these short strands to the first strand. And then we go into this polymerase synthesis where we get new strands to extend those. So you see this is the first cycle splits into two, the second cycle splits into two, the third cycle splits into two. We want to keep doubling it out exponentially. All right. How about DNA out yet? Or are you still hanging in there? So we have this this technology, which is DNA fingerprinting. See this a lot with crimes. Like now we can solve cold cases because we come back and we do DNA testing on samples that were gathered years ago at crime scenes. 
do DNA testing on those and we're either not finding the, the, crimi the convicted criminal's DNA at the scene or then we're finding somebody's other DNA at the scene and maybe finding a new suspect and allowing the old suspect to get out. Now, if you remember the West Memphis Three, this was part of a lot, a lot of their appeals were based on DNA fingerprinting. Their DNA was not at the crime scene. Surprise, if you watch that uh, HBO specials. Um, so they were released. They were gonna just be flat released, but the state got a little scared about what might happen with their release and how much money they might wanna take with them when they got released. Um, so they had to cut a deal to get released and they all cut it just to get released, which was they would plead guilty um, to get released. So if you watch that, that's kind of the state's way because the Supreme Court, not to get all legal on you, but the Arkansas Supreme Court was about to let them loose free. And uh, they were appalled by the, the case, which they should have been. The case was a uh, case. Anyway, won't get into that anymore with that. If you're from West Memphis, you may have feelings about that. But the three guys have been released. And as far as I know, everything's fine. We're going to try to re restore what was taken from them. So how do we do that? DNA fingerprinting. Restriction fragment length polymer polymorphisms or DNA fingerprinting is a two step process. Enzyme digestion and electrophoresis for DNA fragments. You, I think, Heather, is this something that was done in uh, clinical chem? Heather, still with us? Are you talking about DNA fingerprinting? Yes, I am. No, I don't, I don't remember that anyways. I thought this was y'all's little kit that y'all had for uh, Dr. Folsom to do with the electrophoresis. I thought it was called DNA fingerprinting. Anyway, I think you get to do this in clink. You get to, you were supposed to get a technique. There's a technique available. I don't put it that way. I think she does it. We're going to do one next week in immunology, but we're going to play with that instrument. I'll probably be able to tell you more then. Okay. Than we do it if I already did it. <laughs> so here we take an environmental microbe sample, single community, try to extract out the DNA, PCR amplifying to see if we can come up with a fingerprint. Ooh, that's a good fingerprint. So this is how we would put this to use. We have crime scene. This is DNA found at the crime scene. This is suspect one, suspect two, suspect three. So maybe suspect one got arrested, had it just bad luck, got arrested, happened to be, you know, in a fight with the person and they pointed toward them. Maybe this is husband, not saying anything, but maybe that's husband. And this happens to be the actual person that committed the crime. And you see how they would match that up, allow this person to get out of jail and this person to go to jail. So they've, they've solved a lot of cold cases with this. I think they just solved one uh, just the other day. Uh, found the dude out in uh, Sacramento, I think. Yeah, this uh, girl was found dead at a, uh, was it a roadside park or something there? Was it a park somewhere? Anyway, they're, they're still using, they're still solving these crimes, finding people uh, track because what you do is if you committed another crime your DNA gets put into a database and if they they start DNA in a, a lot of crime scenes they just run it through the database find a match and they're coming after you after that uh, state police went out and got this guy just brought him back the other day uh, matrix assisted laser dis, dis, uh, desorption ionization time of flight mass this is a cool machine. This is MALDI. Uh, MALDI is a mass spec. It measures particles based on their mass and charge ratio. So it separates them into an ion column or big thing. And, and we can detect our, by proteonomics, proteomics, the protein pattern of the microorganism. So we've already mentioned the proteomics.
Got some chat going on. Let's do commitments so probably. No, okay. All right. So here we're based on, if we can get back. There we go. So I just want to show you what this looks like. See this big column thing separate? So you put the sample in. And then on each one of these wells, they have a little pattern, like a 96 well, a little plate uh, is where, where they have all these different single well sample right here. And they put it in this charge chamber. So here's your well down here. And then based on how it ends up in the column, ion detecting the charge of the protein, they can ID the organism you have. So we have this pattern for every microorganism. There we go. So you got. And again, I think UAMS has a couple of these, or at least one. So you would take your growth off here, you put it on the, the, the well plate, you would analyze it and it would tell you quickly what you have. It would say, well, that's E. coli. Based on the protein pattern that's detected by Maldi, that's E. coli. That's Staph aureus. So you get a quick ID, but this doesn't do anything for sensitivity. You still have to keep that going. Uh, but if you just needed to know what bug organism you had, it's great for that. So if you've ever seen mass spec, that's what they do. It comes out different protein patterns, different weights of the actual Organism. So we got enterica, aureus, aeruginosa, E. coli patterns, bacillus subtilis. And then we finally make our way to microarray technology known as biochips. And this is the newest thing. This is what I was using in my old micro lab before I came here a year or two years ago. Uh, so microarrays are very small devices, so they're just tabletop. They can fit right here. It looks like a little, um, oh, like a jewelry cleaner is what it looks like to me. You have a little lid you open up and you place a little pouch in it and close the lid. So it's about, about this big. Okay, that's one unit. And then of course it's got a computer attached to it. But this is the lid and you do all your processing right here and loading the pouch. Very simple. Very easy. You take your little sample, add it in there, uh, and load the pouch, and you put the pouch into the, the microarray. So it has thousands of biological reactions to be performed at once on a single chip. The biochip consists of a small rectangular solid surface. It's made of glass or silicon. It has short DNA and RNA probes anchored. So it runs the sample through those probes. Each probe contains millions of copies of oligonucleotide probe. Most cases, nucleic acid is the patient sample first amplified after the amplification. The sample is labeled with fluorescent tag and loaded onto the chip. Hybridization occurs on the chip surface, allowing thousands of hybridization reactions to occur at the same time. Any strand in the target sample that is not complementary to the probe is washed away. You get a negative result. Fluorescent label hybridizes samples detected using a fluorescent detector. The intensity signal at the particular location proportional to the homology of the microbe, nucleic acid, and the probe. Complete sequence matches results in bright fluorescence, while single point mismatches result in dimmer signals. Detection of point mutations can be used here. One prime example of determining genes associated with drug resistance can be useful and identifying such genes guides the physician to a particular drug regime. So here's our sample, okay? And we do a purification of the sample. It's done by the pouch, okay? So I don't do any purification. I just basically take a sample, put it into the pouch, wherever the pouch is loaded, and then we scan for intensity. This is the one I use. It's the BioFire Film Array. FDA cleared for multiplex PCR. It has a big, big use right now. It has a respiratory panel, so we can use sputum. It has blood culture, so a positive blood culture can go into it. 
has a, a GI panel, so for diarrhea. It also has a meningitis encephalitis panel. I never got to use that one, but I take it that cerebral spinal fluid would be used there. So it picks up viruses for respiratory for this list. Adenovirus, coronavirus, reason it would be used here, right? They had to basically come up with the genetic probes for the, this COVID virus, but they did. And now you're running this, but it still takes about an hour um, to, to finalize. So it takes, it's not something we can do quickly. So you think that the antigen test we're using now is 15 minutes you know, that's four times faster, four times as many people getting tested. Influenza A and B, RSV, bacteria from the sputum is Bortella pertussis, uh, chlamydiophilia pneumonia, got that one in there, right? And mycoplasma pneumonia. For blood cultures, staph, staph aureus, strep, strep pyogeny, strep pneumonia, listeria, Gram negatives, enterobacteriaceae, E. coli, Cleb, Serratia, Proteus, Haemophilus, Neisseria, Pseudomonas, yeast, Candidia. So we can do all of that from blood culture bottle sample. Uh, antibiotic resistance, we saw about MEC A for methicillin, VAN A for vancomycin. I don't think we covered vancomycin resistant, but we did cover MEC A for uh, MRSA. The GI panel, Aramonas, Campylobacter, C. diff, toxin A and B, yay, Salmonella. Parasites, Cryptosporidium, Histolytica, Giardia lamely, if it's in the, in the diarrhea, there you go. Adenoviruses, astroviruses, noroviruses, all causing diarrhea too. And then, of course, this is the meningitis encephalitis on the cerebral spinal fluid. Somebody had a. All right, we're going to end there. We've made it to the time. CRISPR, I haven't used CRISPR. It is, it is definitely used. There's a lot of research with CRISPR. Um, gene editing tool is what CRISPR is. So just keep that in mind and we'll. We'll wrap it up right there. Okay, we're going to end Zoom. Stop the share. See you guys this afternoon. End